Ancient hunting cultures around the world believed that by eating an animal's heart, you could acquire the most desirable traits of that beast, be it speed, strength, or ferocity in battle. In this episode, we're gonna get to the heart of the matter of big game hunting and show five great ways to handle what I consider to be the gem of the gut pile. I'm Steven Ranella. To me, hunting isn't only about the pursuit of an animal. It's about who we are and what we're made of. I live to hunt and hunt to live. I am a meat eater. On this meat eater cooking special, we're gonna be talking about a subject which is very dear to my heart, which is hearts, game hearts in particular. I'm gonna show you how to cook five fantastic wild game recipes that get down to the heart of the matter and use the essence of the animal as their primary ingredient. I have seven hearts from seven different animal species laid out in front of me here. And for reference sake, I brought in a couple hearts from domestic animals. We have a lamb heart and a grass-fed beef heart. And if you look at the amount of fat on these hearts here, you get a real sense of one of the primary differences between domestic meat and wild meat. Because the rest of the hearts backing up here are all wild game. We have a wild boar heart, and it is off a male or boar. We have a mule deer heart off a young buck. We have an elk heart off a young bull. We have a moose heart also off a young bull. And we have a caribou heart off a big mature bull. The first heart recipe that I grew up eating was deer, and this is a mule deer right here, but I grew up eating a lot of white-tailed deer hearts. And we had a family tradition where if one of us killed a deer in the morning, we would come home, we would slice the heart and do it in flour and fry it in a pan, and my, or my mom and dad would do it for us. It became very quickly one of my favorite wild game dishes, and I still like to eat heart that way. In fact, that remains my favorite way to eat heart. It's a real simple recipe. Slice the heart into three quarter inch slices, season some flour with salt and black pepper, slice up an onion, and that's really all the ingredients you need. If you want to get fancy, you can fry up some sage leaves into crispy green sage chips. So you're actually garnishing with one of the mule deer's own favorite foods. Sage has sort of a natural oil on it. Flour sticks it really nice. You can lay it in hot olive oil, but not too hot because it really wants to burn. Once our sage leaves get nice and crispy, toss some onions in a pan to start browning. Dust up the heart slices with the seasoned flour and start frying them up. This buck we're cooking here is a Colorado mule deer. Every year I have some kind of mule deer trip I plan. I always think I'm gonna go out and kill the one gargantuan mule deer that I'd like to kill in my life. And I never do. And toward the end of every mule deer trip, I always end up shooting a meat buck. And this guy right here, I killed him my last day of the hunt. I caught him in the early morning coming up onto a big mesa top where they bed in some cuts and rock piles up there. He's hit. I like to eat the heart almost rare, which is fine on deer, elk, caribou, antelope, hooved animals, it's fine to eat it rare. So when I cut into it, I want it to still be a little bit, not bloody, but still nice and purple. And the minute I see that the juices are running clear-ish and not running bloody, that's done. So this is ready to go. You see those sage leaves? Before you cook them, they're limber and a little bit oily. When you fry them, they actually turn into little sage chips. You take them and just do sort of a crispy little sagey garnish, or you can actually lay pieces out like that. Finally, because this is gonna run the risk of looking too nice and dainty, take a little old-fashioned ketchup. My dad didn't like us when we were kids to put ketchup on deer tenderloin because he thought it was disrespectful or something to the animal. Even if he just deep fried it a deep fryer, we weren't supposed to put ketchup on it. But we always put ketchup on deer heart. I think it has a beautiful look. There's something kind of elegant about it. And there's also something with the heart and the ketchup and like this whole heart blood kind of thing going on. It's just a great presentation. And it's like when you bite it, this stuff just kind of snaps, almost like the way a really good hot dog snaps. Every time I eat it, though, I do go back to that, what I think of as my favorite meal growing up, just because kind of the sense of camaraderie and accomplishment that came from, we'd go out and get a deer, we'd come home and eat it in the morning. And so when I eat this, like, those memories kind of flood back to me in, in a really nice way. 
I think that's one of the powers of food, though, is that done properly, each dish you eat carries so much with it, so many memories with it. That's one of the things I like about eating wild game is there's always a story that goes really deep within every meal. So we recognize the heart as being this center of ourselves, that when you feel an emotion very strongly, you feel it in your heart. We talk about getting to the heart of the matter. It's the core of a being. That also is recognized in a lot of indigenous cultures where you'll find if you look into their mythologies that they think that by eating the heart of the game animals you harvest, you're sort of like taking in the essence of the animal or incorporating attributes of that animal into yourself. To eat the heart of a fast animal makes you fast. To eat the heart of a strong animal makes you strong. And I don't know if we can really say that, that that's literally true, but I think that it's true kind of in an important way that occurs in our minds and in our imaginations. And so for that reason, I've always been adamant about eating game hearts. And I even know that my dad, when we were kids, if he'd find a gut pile left by other hunters, he'd dig through that gut pile and pull the heart out, and we would cook the heart up. As far as the attribute that I would like to have, if I could, by ingesting his heart, collect something from him, is how environmentally intolerant they are. Mule deer have a sort of specific ecosystem. They just have a very definite idea of how they like to live and where they like to live. Unlike a generalist species, like whitetail that can thrive everywhere, the mule deer has just like this sense of what he likes and what he needs. And I admire that in animals and I admire it in people where you have a rigid sense of what it is you want from life and you refuse to accept any other circumstances. The next dish we're gonna deal with is a marinated and grilled heart, and we're gonna be using a caribou heart. This is a mature bull caribou. He was killed in the Brooks Range of Alaska. On a human heart, which is half this size, this muscle is pumping about 2,000 gallons of blood a day. So on an animal this big, which is bigger than a person, bigger heart, it's pumping in more than 2,000 gallons a day. The first thing I do with the heart of any horned or antlered game is to trim the tallow off. It has a very waxy feel in your mouth. The next step is to core it out, which is a standard thing I do every time I'm cooking a heart. As you cut, you'll feel like very membranous stuff in there. The way I sometimes describe it is you're coring out a bell pepper. When I'm grilling hearts, because they're so lean, I like to make a marinade. It's got a lot of oil in it, some vinegar to soften it, and then some seasoning. My marinade is pretty simple. I start with a base of olive oil, add in some white wine vinegar, and then stir in a Montreal-style rub mix composed of salt, black and red pepper, onion and garlic powder, coriander, rosemary, and thyme. You could just put the slices in the marinade and then let them sit for a few hours, but I like doing mine in a vacuum-sealed bag. You need less marinade that way, and it seeps into the meat much faster. Now, this caribou heart I've had in the freezer for well over a year. You can freeze them for an incredibly long time in a deep freeze, and they're still good. But because this heart is a little bit old, it's gonna benefit more so than if it was just a fresh heart right out of the animal. This needs to soak for a few hours for the marinade to do its job. The next dish I'm gonna be dealing with is pickled heart. It's important to keep in mind all these different dishes we're cooking here, they're not specific to certain kinds of hearts. If you got a heart from an animal we're not talking about, it will work for all of the dishes we're making. And this heart is from a you know, wild pig, Sue Scraffa, and he was killed in Northern California. This had to be a board, it was running. And I kind of let out, and as I passed right about here on the crosshairs, I touched off the shot and hit him right back here. You do not put the meat in the brine raw. That's important. For this dish, we're gonna slice this boar's heart real thin, poach it in stock, and then when it's cooked through, it's gonna go into the brine. And always remember, when you're dealing with wild pigs and bears, you need to cook the meat thoroughly because it will carry the larva of trichinella spiralis. That's what gives you trichinosis. So what I'm gonna do is poach this in stock to cook it. So not a rolling boil, just a nice gentle simmer. We're gonna build the brine for them. This right here, white wine vinegar. You can use any kind of vinegar you like. Salt, sugar, rainbow peppercorns. And here I have pickling spice. 
and I've enhanced mine very strongly with about a teaspoon of red pepper flakes to give it some heat. I'm gonna shake this up to incorporate it all. The heart, you could take it right now and put salt on it, eat it, it tastes okay. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna build up all my layers of stuff inside this jar. Take some sliced garlic, put that in there, a couple onions, slice of meat, garlic, onion, slip a bay leaf in there, and then take the brine. You can fill this thing all the way up to get it covered, keep everything covered in there, or pull out some of the stuff so you got a good cover. It just takes a week or two for the brine to get distributed in there and turn everything into like nice and pickled. For long-term storage, you'd pressure seal it, but just for a week or two because it's so acidic, you're fine just to set it right in your fridge. You can't keep it in there for months. You just want to keep it in there long enough for the meat to absorb the brine and get that nice pickled taste. I'm gonna grill the marinated caribou heart. Along with the grilled heart, I'm gonna do a simple side dish recipe that I stole from my buddy Eric, who may have stolen it from the chef, Steve Raiklin. Basically, I wanna make a couple little boats, brush the inside with oil. I leave the peppers face down on the grill just long enough to get some color on them. Then brush the bottoms with oil and flip them over. Then I fill up the boat. This is just black beans with onion and garlic, a little cumin, salt and pepper. When you put that meat down on the wire, and it just like whap, and it just seems like it's stuck there. The grate will eventually cook the meat and release it. Just wait till you can just gently lift it up before you want to flip it. You want it still a little bit pinkish in the center of the heart, maybe five minutes per side, if that, depending on how hot your grill is. After I flip them, I like to pile some mozzarella on the pepper boats and then close the grill's lid in order to melt the cheese. The final step on the red peppers is to take cilantro, like so. And these guys, you just serve like this, one per person. They're very nice. So this is the caribou heart, a little bit bloody inside still. See if you squeeze it, it comes out, it's juicy. This one is still very heart-like. I think that this preparation kind of maintains the integrity of the heart. You're not gonna pass it along to someone and have them think it's just run-of-the-mill meat. If I was gonna steal an attribute from caribou by eating caribou heart, the thing I envy most about the animal is it's like intense wanderlust. No big game animal in North America migrates farther and longer than caribou. They're almost in this perpetual state of migration, just traveling, traveling, traveling. Can reach to be several years old and pass through places they've never been before. And you compare that to something like a white-tailed deer that might live its entire existence on a couple square miles. They're great animals and I admire that their desire to go is very appealing to me. The next thing we're gonna do is the most glorious of the heart dishes, and it's stuffed heart. This is from a young bull moose, maybe like two and a half year old bull from British Columbia. We have a complicated relationship because I took a stupid shot on this moose and wounded him. I got up to him and he wound up standing up and charged me. Oh my God. Oh, no. run. Oh my God. Run. I can't look at any part of this moose without thinking one, how scary that was and two, kind of how glad I was that, that happened because it was so much fun looking back on it. I'm gonna make a simple stuffing just like I was gonna stuff a turkey. It's gonna be bread-based. We're gonna have apple in it, salt and pepper. I got some raisins here that I just have soaking in brandy, walnut, carrot, onion, garlic, celery, parsley, and oregano, a little bit of sage. And then this here is a magical good ingredient. This is oyster mushrooms. Every year for Christmas, my brother sends me bags of dried mushrooms that he picks in Montana. The stuffing has a bunch of ingredients, but it's pretty straightforward. It starts off with sauteing the onion, garlic, carrot, and oyster mushrooms. Once those are starting to soften up and mingle, 
Add in the celery, walnut, and the herbs. That veggie mix then goes in with the breadcrumbs, apples, and raisins. It's a little bit too dry right now. I'm just gonna add some stock. What you're going for is you want to feel like the perfect wet snowball packing kind of snow. Okay, first I'm gonna fill the side that's responsible for sending blood to and from the lungs. And the part that sends it out to the body. Leave it a little bit loose here so it looks nice. I'm gonna brush it with oil and just makes it color up nice. I don't think it's gonna take two hours. Maybe take close to that because we have it stuffed. Either way, I'm gonna cook it to 145 degrees. Here's the heart of what I consider to be the most powerful animal in North America. And it's not a grizzly bear, it's an elk. And anyone who's seen the way an elk can go up a mountainside at a full tilt run and do more in a few seconds than you can do in an hour will appreciate the power of this heart. They're a fantastic animal. This elk here I shot just coming into the rut. He was killed in reclaimed coal country in Kentucky. I'm gonna make heart chili tacos with this. And it's almost a shame, but I'm gonna take this thing, I'm gonna cut it up into a dice about like that. This gets started simple, just cooking down the diced heart in some oil with garlic and onion. You can see now there's a lot of liquid built up. I didn't add any water to this. This is just liquid coming off the meat. I'm just gonna just go slow, adding in stuff. I'm gonna do chili, quite a bit of chili. That's kind of the main thing I'm after here. Smoked paprika, I'm putting some cumin, just a touch of black pepper, and then salt. I wanna keep it this amount of liquid in here as I'm cooking it. So I'm gonna check it, and I might need to add a little bit of water in a while. Ideally, you'd let this cook very slowly for a couple hours. What's nice about this dish is you don't need to worry about when people are gonna eat or when they're getting there, it's just ready to go. You lay all the stuff out, people come in, make a taco when they want. You can cook it for an hour and a half or four hours as long as you keep a little bit of liquid in there. One of the most admirable features about elk in my mind is the way they stick together. A lot of animals, like when a predator gets a hold of one of them, the other ones are like, better you and me, and they all take off. But elk, they have this thing where they, they'll spin around and try to defend their buddy. I kind of really respect that idea of sticking to your friends, looking out for everyone's safety. That really, with the chili on there, and the way it's cooked down, tender like that, you could even mess with people and not tell them it's heart and tell them it's something different, and you might get away with it. It's a very pleasant, accessible way to approach the heart. Once the heart has been in the pickling brine for a few hours, you can taste a piece to see whether or not you need to adjust the brine. Ideally, you're gonna let this stuff hang out in your fridge for you know, about two weeks or so before you eat it. It's not gonna get more hot tasting over time. So at this point right now, if you like a good spicy pickle, put it in. In two weeks, this is gonna be a fine, fine blend and a great use for a heart. It really beats the hell are leaving that thing laying in a gut pile out in the woods. As far as the attribute from a wild boar, it would be its tenacity, its resilience, and that it can defy your best efforts to eradicate it. We have to work so hard to maintain a habitat and to conserve so many of the big game species we hunt. But this one, even when you want it gone, you can't get rid of it. They're the ultimate badasses. In the end, this moose cooked for about an hour and a half. But rather than going by that, just cook yours until you get it up to the temperature of what you like for me. It should be a little pinker. I'll admit to overcooking this a little bit. I think it's still gonna be fine. You know, when I think about moose, and I think about this moose, that after I hit him and knocked him down twice, he got up and still had it in him to charge me and knock me over. And uh, like a fighting spirit, you know, real fighters, tough. If I was gonna pick up something from this moose, I would wanna pick up that ability to take a hit. 
that's a nice preparation right there because it has like a steak-like quality, has a roast meat-like quality. It's very tender. The stuffing's really nice because it gives it kind of a familiarity. You think of stuffing as being sort of like a comfort food. With the exotic blend of the heart, there's just kind of like a nice tension there. It's a nice dynamic. So that's five great ways to cook heart. And really, there's no reason to ever, ever, ever leave a heart laying on a gut pile out in the woods. You need to bring those things home, and we need to embrace them. And if those ancient hunter-gatherer cultures are right, and we really can absorb attributes from the animals whose hearts we eat, then this has been a very constructive day of self-improvement. Colorado mule deer, the animal that's just so intolerant of degradation of its habitat. North Slope caribou, an animal that seems to be driven by a sense of wanderlust and with astonishing endurance. California wild boar, a species that is just marked by its tenacity. A British Columbia moose, an animal that can take a hit. And Kentucky elk, a species that we know for sticking together and looking out for one another.